Good evening, brethren. We've got a good number back tonight, considering the activities of the day and all that's going on. I know many of you are absolutely exhausted, but your being here is a, a great testament to your desire to know more about God's will and to spend time with the family of God. Certainly appreciate everyone who did whatever you did today. We're so thankful. We've got such a, a good congregation, brethren. We have folks that love each other. We have good leadership. We've uh, got a great deacons, a couple of great song leaders. We just, we just got good things that uh, we're, we could be so grateful for. And, and today, uh, you know, I uh, just, just can't, uh, don't want to go on about it too much. Cause, um, but it's just uh, not even sad, you know, that Brother Warren's gone. I mean, he's gone to great things, you know, but I'm going to miss him. I'm sad for myself. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, Jim Warren was a good friend. He was, he was a good friend, and I, I am definitely going to miss him, as I, as I know that you will as well. We are an open book. If you could just open up your chest, just imagine, I mean, that people read us. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that we're an open epistle, an open book, read of all men. The way that we live our lives is everybody can see it. They, they know you. They know your personality. They know how you live your life, and it's a testament really of our actions our life is a sermon i would like to have preached this this morning i thought it went whole much better with uh, with brother warren's uh, uh memorial service and funeral than than is uh than the one that we had but you know because of television and radio you'd like to stay with material you've started but in first peter chapter 2 at verse 11 the bible says dearly beloved i beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul from this point forward, Peter is going to be doing what Paul would do so often in the last part of his epistles. He's going to be encouraging us with practical things. This is what you need to be doing. These are the things, the step-by-step -step things that you ought to try to put in your life that you'll be a better person. He's not going to talk so much now about the crucifixion in Christ, the, the doctrinal matters. Those, Not that doctrine is not practical and, and, and practice it doesn't include doctrine, but that he's going to talk about our way of life. And so... Uh, uh, we're, that's what we're going to be doing with chapter 2, verses 11 through 3, 7. Our great power and influence, each one of us, you don't realize, just listening to Missy and, and a few of those back there today talking about that do-right rule, you know, <laughs> that might seem like an, uh, just, a, just a statement that might even get on your nerves when you're in school. But, uh, you know, she was talking about how nowadays, you know, years later, there's people posting on Facebook that do-right rule. I mean, it has influence. People remember that. It sticks with them. And if we continue to live our lives as Christians and are faithful and show people in our lives what it means to be a Christian, how we conduct ourselves, how we live our lives, the, the, the business matters that we do with each other, that, that we have in the community, that we are up, you know, upright citizens, that we're honest, they, they see that in your life. You build up a reputation and you have a tremendous influence. But it can be an influence for evil. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 says, your glorying is not good. Paul is re rebuking the church at Corinth and saying, you're bloating, you're, 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 you know, know, you, know you not that a le little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. They were gloating, if you remember, because a man had taken his father's wife, obviously a stepmother, and were living in a relationship. He said even the, the heathen uh, thought was wrong and that he shouldn't be doing that. Of course, our influence can be for good. That's what we want. Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, right after the Beatitudes, he would say, you're the salt of the earth. Brethren, that should be us. We're the very thing that gives the earth, it's the, the, the world, its savor. The salt hath lost its savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? What good is it? Is it thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot? Verse 14, you're a light on, uh, to the world. That's us. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. That's what we are to be, the salt of the earth, a light. Neither do men put a light, or neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine but more before men. That's that little song that we sing, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. And we need to do that. We need to have the right influence with our friends and neighbors. The Christian uses his life and influence for the glory of God. Remember that. Because we're going to be talking about some things, because there's sometimes people don't treat you right. Sometimes people are ugly to you. They don't, they don't treat you right. And what are you to do? Well, get back at them. No, Peter's going to tell us absolutely the different, different way. He's going to say, no, you don't do that. 
as we look at that here in just a moment. We're going to explore four areas of life where, well, Peter is, and we're just going to follow in his tracks, where the Christian preaches by the life he lives. Number one, abstaining from fleshly lusts. That's the first thing. You know, that's the thing we've got to, hey, listen, I'm going to quit doing this, and I'm going to start doing that. It's not always that easy. This body has appetites. It has fleshly appetites. It's going to want to do things, and, and I'm going to see things that are going to entice me and things of this nature. I've got to put those away. Number two, good citizenship. Three, honest in business. And four, godly in the home. That's just the way this breaks down from chapter 2 through verse 7 of chapter 3. First of all, standing from fleshly lusts. This word lust comes from the Greek word epithumia. Thumia means to like burn, to smolder. And epi would be like on top of, to smooth, to, to kind of burn over, if you will. Kind of to sit on something, to linger on something. Uncontrolled desire, desire for what is forbidden is how strong would uh, define this. And we're to put these things aside. We're to let those things go. It says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. They war against our soul. Fleshly, carnal, having the nature of flesh, i.e. the appetites, uh, the animal appetites, if you will. The Christian will abstain from practices that arouse lust. Why and how and what are those? Pornography. That is the very reason that it is out there. People who start pornographic sites do so because they know people are interested in things like that. They want to see that. And you, you may come across some images. You may open up an email and that might be thrown in front of you. Don't feel like you're weird if you have the desire to want to see more of it. That's kind of the way we're wired. You know, that's, that they do that. That's human nature. Now, here's the Christian part. This is where it gets tough. Because you've got to say, nope, not doing that. I'm not following after that. I'm not going to let Satan take me down that road. I'm not going to respond to that. I'm not going to act like the animal nature of men acts. I'm going to be different. I'm going to do what God would have me to do. And that's when we click the button or get rid of it. And we don't keep taking after the bait. Because James tells us if we grab a hold of that bait and run with it, it's going to kill us. It's going to bring forth death. But don't think that something's wrong with you or you're inordinately evil because you see something like that and you're interested. Brethren, friends, that's the way you're wired, okay? Women are good looking to men. Men are good looking to women. That's nature, and that's for a reason. And even today, we see people who are so wired wrong and taught wrong that they don't even get that aspect of it anymore. But that's not something that's evil and bad. God has designed us like that, and he's also gave us a way whereby to deal with those appetites, and it's called marriage. And unfortunately, our young people today are not getting the message because it's not happening. They don't realize the one man, the one woman, the home forever. They're like, do whatever you want to do with anybody you want to do. And you know that we're really reaping what was sown back in the 60s with the, the hippie culture, you know, the free love and all that. We're just basically reaping what we've sown. You remember that sermon we were looking at in Brother Warren's uh, book, The Boomerang of Sin? Well, guess what? The boomerangs come back, and it's all over us now. We're reaping exactly what was sowed 40 years ago, pornography. Get it out of your life. And from what I understand, that it's addictive. It is kind of like a gambling compulsion. It's kind of like an, a drug compulsion. People that have OCD or compulsive, pro compulsive problems anyway need to stay away from such things. It's powerful. And while it might not trigger you, it may your spouse. It could hurt somebody in your home. So try to get that junk out of your house. Set up filters and things so that it can't come in to your house. Because some people are addicted to it to the point they can't do without it. And they actually have treatment programs now for that. Adult-only movies, there's a rule that we ought to keep. If it ain't good enough for the kids, if it's not good enough for you. Okay, if you won't let your children watch it, there's a good chance you shouldn't be watching it as well. Lewd television. Modern dance. You want to know what people are doing? You see people dancing on television, just turn off the music. It's obvious what they're doing. Uh, there's no place in that in the, in the Christian. Refrain from prom promiscuous petting. This is geared a little bit toward our younger people. This is something you need to stay away from. Okay, uh, there, there are several words in the Bible that, that have this idea behind it. It means doing things that you ought not to be doing, especially somebody that's not your wife and things of this nature. You have these desires as a young person. Uh, older people have the desires as well. 
But the bottom line is this usually is a more of a problem with younger people as they start dating and things of this nature. Stay away from these kind of things which can only build to something. You want to keep those fleshly appetites under control because they're very, very, very powerful. Uh, people have lost marriages. I mean, look at, look, just look at the mess that we've got going on in Washington, D.C. right now because a couple of generals can't control themselves. And you know, one of the things that kind of, I kind of look back at, you know, we're thinking, oh, this is just terrible. Do you remember a fellow by the name of Eisenhower? You know, I used to think he was a pretty great guy. I had no idea that he had an affair the whole time that he was, uh, you know, a president and, and had his mistress over in Germany back when he ruled. Uh, you know, that really kind of broke my heart. I did not know that. These things come and go. Men get in these powerful positions, and all of a sudden, they think they can do anything that they want to, and they're not going to be held accountable. It was going on then. It went on with David. It went on. It's been going on forever. These appetites are powerful. No matter who you are, they can grab a hold of you. And that's why we try to encourage our children, young people, listen, stay out of these situations. Stay out of these situations. That's one of the things that, you know, at Bible camp, when they let me talk to the kids about things like this, we separate, you know, guys go to one group and girls go to another area, and we talk about things like this because they're at that age where that's important. And one of the things I show them is a vehicle. And I say, do you see what that is? And most of them say, it's a car. I say, no, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity and you need not take advantage of that opportunity. And I try to encourage them to not go parking and not go to do things that they ought not to be doing because it leads to things that can destroy lives. You know, and you think about it, you're, when you're doing something like that and you're not married, you're actually stealing. You're stealing another man's wife. Somebody, someday, you know, she's going to be married to somebody else or he's going to be married to somebody else. You're stealing somebody's spouse before they even get them. Not only that, but you're stealing somebody's daughter. You're stealing somebody's sister. You're doing more. You're, you're causing more problems there. And see, our society today, they don't even want to look at it like that. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. You know, it's like we are a bunch of animals, and that's just not true. We are human beings, and the decisions that we make, we need to stay away from these type of things because they, they hurt people. They hurt families. Not only that, but the Christian motives for abstaining are what? First of all, they war against the soul. I don't want things that are going to war against my soul. I want things that are going to help me, things that are going to make me better. So I'm going to stay away from these fleshly lusts. Remember that we're just sojourners. This is temporary. I don't care if we live to be 80 years old. It's just temporary. 90 years old, temporary. 100 years old, temporary. That other life, the eternal part of us, the part that's made to live forever, goes on forever. Remember, I've just got to fight this so long. I'm going to be out of this before you know it. Philippians 3.20 uh, says, for our conversation, the way we live, is in heaven. From hence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our own. That's what we want to do. Colossians 3, most of you could quote this. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. Notice verse 2. Set your affection on things that are above, not on the earth. For you're dead in Christ. Your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall also appear with him in glory. Think on things greater than that. And I know sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes, no matter where you are in your, what age you are, you know, you're motivated by different things in life. Younger folks, sometimes fleshly appetites are so strong. Older people lust after different things such as power and money, things of that nature. And wherever you are in life, you're going to have these problems. Try, wherever you are, to think about heavenly things. Think about the good things. Think of Philippians 4 at verse 8, those things that are true, honest, and pure uh, think of those things. Put your mind on higher things. Not only are we sojourners, but we're here for a short period of time. Whereas in heaven, we're forever. James 4, verse 13, really emphasizes that idea about being here for a short time. You know, and it talks about, you know, you're just like a vapor. appears for a short time, and then it vanishes away. One of the things, I wish they quit putting it up there, because it just, I can't, I go through a metaphorical, uh, philosophical thing every time I drive under those signs now on the freeway. And uh, I'm pretty impressed. He's already quiet. Okay, there we go. I didn't think he'd stop that easy. But you drive under those signs, and it talks about there's 890-something people dead in Tennessee. That just makes me think for a minute, doesn't it, you? That's a lot of people. That's a lot of families that are affected. That's just a lot of destruction. But, boy, I tell you, James says the same thing. 
You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know when that old boy on that transfer truck hauling 50,000 pounds of whatever decides he needs to text Betty Sue again because she was mad at him last time he got done reading his text. Doesn't that, isn't that amazing you're going down the road, transfer truck beside you, dude's uh, typing on a cell phone. That scares me to death. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. It could be just like that. So think about good things. Get those bad things out of our minds. Where the Christian needs to be aware of his opportunity to influence for good. You know people are seeing you. You're an open book. People are watching. Do the right thing. Try to have an influence for good. Remember, your life is Christ. You're trying to lead a good example to lead other people to Christ. Let that help motivate you to do the right thing, to study the right thing, to, to try to be the right kind of person and not the wrong kind of person. You are an influence. And it seems like for so many years of my life, I fought that. I wanted to rebel. I wanted to be, you know, cool or whatever. I wanted to actually be a, a hindrance, if you will. And you look back at that now and you say, why in the world would anybody want to do that? That's why I guess I have a lot of patience with folks that, that are there. I've been there. That's not a good thing. You want to have influence on people for good. Help them do good. Good citizenship. Notice with me, if you will, verses 13 through 17. He says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. That's the laws. King is supreme. Governors as unto them that are sent by the punishment of evildoers with the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It's amazing, but in some of the early history, in fact, the Tic Tacticus, a couple of Roman historians, they, when they mention Christians, they mention it in a context of, of them being lawbreakers. Or accused. First of all, uh, one of the historians mentions Christians, and obviously it's just out of ignorance, says that they're, they're rumored to be cannibals because they, you know, ate the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. They drank his blood and ate his flesh, and that guy just didn't understand that. And he said, well, you know, they're heathen. They're, they're cannibals. And so sometimes they were looked at as being other than what they ought to be. Acts 17, 7. Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. These men are bringing these Christians before the council and saying, these guys are doing wrong because they say there's another king, this one Jesus. Well, that's, you're talking about stretching something and trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. Yes, they looked at Jesus as king, as Lord, but that wouldn't mean they were going to honor Caesar on earth. Even Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So people have misunderstood Christianity and have tried to accuse it to be something evil when we know that that's not. And that's one of the things Peter says. With your influence, the way you live your life, you're going to show people that Christianity is a good thing. But remember, in order to obey God, one must respect civil authority. Brethren, that's something we're abound to do. Romans 13, 1, the higher powers. We're to obey the civil government. And of course, as long as it's in accordance with God's will. Verse 15, their submission would put silence to the accusations, these, these accusations that they had been something they weren't to be. Christians could not use their license as, or liberty as a license. Notice this, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak or the word there as veil of maliciousness, but as servants of God. In other words, don't, don't do something evil. You know, all these companies, all these people that are using the, uh, what is it, 403B or nonprofit thing, you know, these so-called churches, you know, that are, I mean, just raking in money, hands over fist. And bottom line, it usually ends up just being one guy in charge, the, the pastor or the preacher or whatever, and he's literally just making tax-free income, you know, by, by the, the, that's what this is talking about. Don't use your Christianity, don't use your liberty as something to, uh, as a license to do something that's wrong. We're just so blessed to be in a country that says, hey, listen, we want the churches to be successful. We don't want to have to support you. That's the whole idea between separation of church and state. We don't want to fund you with tax dollars. We're not going to do that, but we're going to give you opportunities to do good. We know churches do good things. You're benevolent. You take care of the needy. You help us out and things like that. So the government blesses that. And, of course, Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter here is saying don't, don't abuse that. The Christian recognizes one law that's superior to civil authority, and, of course, that's God's law. And Acts chapter 5, Peter asked that very question. When they told him, listen, don't you do this anymore, Peter says, should we or we ought to obey God rather than men? That's what we ought to be doing. And right now, I can't think of too many laws in our country who, that, that test our Christianity. Now, that may change. There may be some things that come through. But, you know, for the most part, we're not asked to do things contrary to the will of God. Uh, now, that may, may change, 
But as long as we keep voicing our opinions and making sure people know what we expect out of them when we elect them, then that, that shouldn't be a problem. Good citizenship, honest in business. Notice beginning with verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. It's easy to like, you know, to, if you work for a supervisor you really like, a good person treats you fairly, you know, it's easy to work for them. You know, I mean, you want to do a good job. But then there's always that one person that's got to be there, right? I think they hire them for that particular person, that purpose, to make your life miserable, always trying to find something, always nitpicking. Peter says, you obey them too. You obey them too. It's easy to do the other. But this one, you, you obey the forward as well. Notice this. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Peter says, now this is tough. This is something to be commendated. When a man will put up with somebody mistreating him, being ugly to him and everything else for the sake of God, because God says it's the right thing to do. He makes that practical in verse 20 by saying, for what glory is it if when ye, if when ye be buffeted, that's literally smacked around, for your faults? He says, you shall take it patiently. He says, that's what you would expect if you're doing something wrong is to, is to be buffeted. But he says, but if when you do well, you're doing your best you can. You're trying to do the job, but this person is still giving you a hard time. Peter says, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So it's one thing, you know, to, to work for a guy that you like and try to do right by him, but if you work for somebody that, that's tough to work for, that makes everything difficult, Peter says, you still listen to him. You still listen to them, and you do what they say, and you do a good job. Not because of them, but because you're a Christian. Because you're a child of God, and you're going to have an influence. People are going to see your job performance. They're going to see what you're doing, and they're going to appreciate that. At least you're going to have an influence. The principles laid out in the New Testament, brethren, call for, first of all, respect, what we just looked at. You respect a position, even though there may be somebody in it that's not worthy, even though there may be somebody in it that's giving you a hard time, respect the position, do your job. And there's a dignity in work. There's a dignity at work. I, I was at a gospel meeting not too long ago, and the preacher said that work was, was, a, was a punishment uh, for sin. Well, that's not all entirely true. If you remember, before sin was in the camp, God put Adam in the garden. And what did he tell him to do the garden? You keep it. There's work in keeping a garden. Now, what happened after the ground was cursed was that job got a whole lot harder. I don't know what all that involves. I'd imagine it's got something to do with weeds, but <laughs> it got a lot harder. His job, though, to, to work, man was put in the garden to tend it. To be busy, to work is, is a good thing. It's not a punishment for sin. The cursing of the ground and that job becoming more difficult uh, was as a result of sin. The Bible principle is pretty easy on this one. No work, no food. Worse than an infidel if you don't work. And yet we have to be careful that in our country we're not kind of promoting the not work idea. I was talking with a cashier at Walmart. You know, Walmart's been really been getting beat up in the media and everything. And maybe rightfully so, I don't know. But I was just talking to the cashier who was going to have to work a 12-hour shift and then come back in like eight hours later. And I said, well, it's going to be tough. She said, yeah. And and I said, uh, why is that? Why are they scheduling you like that? And she says, we don't have any employees. And I was like, man, last I heard, employment rate, unemployment is like 10% or something. You know, it's way up there. There's all kinds of people needing jobs and things, and they, they can't get enough employees. I, that just kind of struck me, you know. Uh, maybe that we could help along those lines. And, and this idea that a person can be on assistance and, and be perfectly healthy yet not required to do anything, to earn that SSI or, or, or to earn those food stamps or to earn that welfare, that there's no, no strings attached like, hey, you need to find a job or, hey, could, maybe you could clean up Third Street, you know, or, while you're not working. To, the, brethren, there's dignity in work. There's nothing wrong with work. It's a good thing. Uh, most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You do it every day. And I don't think it's mean or evil to, to say, hey, you need to do it too. <laughs> I've got to do it. Why don't you do it? Uh, because that's what life's all about, isn't it? Taking care of our families. That's a Bible principle. Well, look, fella, if you won't work, you can't eat. And, you know, by the way, you're worse than infidel because you won't take care of your family. That's a Bible principle, brethren. There's nothing ugly in that. 
Ecclesiastes 9.10 not only says that, but whatever you find to put your hand to, to do, do it with all your might. Do it with all your might. Have a good time at it. Be proud of it. Work. There's going to come a time when you're not going to be able to do that anymore. But not only honest in business, but godly in the home. Godly in the home. Notice with me, if you will, in chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, check this out now, a man doesn't obey the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the way or the conversation, the manner of life of the wife. The, Peter's saying through the inspiration now, through the Holy Spirit, God's saying, you can have an influence on your husband to help him obey the gospel without teaching him the Bible. If the Bible, he's going to have to learn those things, but he's going to want to have a desire to do that because he sees the way you live your life and says, you know what? She's on to something. Through his conversation, through her conversation, we can have an influence on people. He's saying, by the way you live in your life, you can win over your husband for Christ. Isn't that amazing? But I know everybody in this room probably knows somebody that's done that very thing. It may have taken years, but in the end, it worked. <clears throat> Verse 2 through 4, notice. While they behold your chaste conversation, that means a, a well-lived life, coupled with fear, that's the word phobos, uh, reverence, but the word, you know, the Greek pretty clear there, fear is fear. Whose adorning let it not be with outward adorning of plating the hair, wearing of gold, and putting on of apparel. You know, there's a lot of churches right here in our own area who would tell their women right now they need to put their hair up in a bun and don't ever put on makeup because that's what it says right here. But every one of them old gals is wearing some apparel, isn't she? <laughs> every one of them's dressed. That stuff's not to be taken literally. What he's trying to say there is don't stress the outward and forget the in for inward. Okay, it's not wrong for a, a woman to try to, to look better or for a man to want to look better. Uh, we, we're, there's a certain amount of, you know, taking care of ourselves, grooming, hygiene. What he's saying is don't let that be the focus. Don't let that be where you spend all your time. What's happening on the inside is a whole lot more important. What's happening on the inside is a whole lot more important. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. A dedicated life is attractive. It is attractive, and I believe it's one of the reasons that the Mormons are converting people hands over fist is because people see, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a little whistle. They see those young men running around, look like model citizens, clean cut, you know, in the white shirts, black ties, and, you know, the Mormon family is a very appealing thing, and that's what they try to sell. That is one of their selling points. They don't mind telling you that. They want you to know that's one of their stresses is the family. They'll put it on billboards. They'll put it on television. And uh, that's something they want you to see. That's their ticket. This is our sales pitch. We're family-oriented. Brethren, why is the church not known for that? Why is it Howard Hughes would hire, I can't remember what denomination he had hired, but he had hired them to keep his books because they were known for their honesty. Why isn't that members of the church? Why don't we stick out like that? Because we don't wear white shirts and a little black tie with the badges on. Okay, that's probably what you're saying. But there's an appeal to that. A dedicated life is an appealing thing. Let's let people see our dedication to Christ in the way that we live our lives. Wives subject to their husbands. Now notice this. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being a subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as, as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Basically, basically what he's saying here is the home needs to be structured with the husbands, the head of the house. And the wife's to be in subjection. It's not got something to do with who's better. Or even in some cases, more qualified intellectually. But it's positional authority. Just like in the church. You have elders, you have preachers, you have deacons. There's folks that are in charge. That would be the elders, not the deacons, not the preacher. They're the ones who oversee the flock, who feed the flock. The evangelist has his role. The deacons have their role. But it is priority. I mean, excuse me, not priority. It's, it's, it's uh, well, now I've lost what I'm trying to say. It's positional authority. It's the position that we hold, just like uh, in the school. You only have one principal. Then you have the teachers. Then you have the students. I mean, there's a position there. In the home, there has to be the head, and that head is to be the husband. That is not something to be flaunted. That is not something to be rubbed in a woman's face, because notice the next verse. Likewise, ye husbands. Dwell with them, the wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. If the man is honoring his wife as he should, there should never be a 
a struggle here with who's in, you know, who's the head and who is in submissive if the husband is doing what he needs to be doing as far as honoring his wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together with the grace of life. Notice this, that your prayers be not hindered. Husbands, treat your wife right. If you don't, your prayers can be hindered. Husband is to respect the wife. Best argument for Christianity is the Christian. Best argument for it. A well-lived life, a Christian life, a person who lives the Christian life is a great argument for Christianity. It's the way life ought to be. We preach by the life that we live. I want to close this with a poem from Leroy Brownlow, longtime gospel preacher and writer. It says, The gospel according to you. There's a gospel according to Matthew, to Mark, to Luke, and John too. There's another gospel that many are reading, the gospel according to you. All teachings we find in the Bible are facts we know to be true. You must live them to make them the gospel, the gospel according to you. Many read not the words of the Bible. I will tell you what some of them do. They are reading the book that you are writing, the gospel according to you. There's great power in gospel preaching. The Bible teaches that is true. But the sermon most likely to influence others is the gospel according to you. God, help us to be faithful to Jesus, to live all his teachings so true, so that all may see his spirit in the gospel according to you. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day by the things that you do, by things that you say. Others read that gospel, whether faithless or true, Say, what is the gospel according to you? There's that old uh, poem as well that we think of sometimes. I'd rather see a sermon as to hear one. And that's got a lot of good points in it as well. Brethren, the Christian life is the best argument for Christianity. These are very practical things that we can do in our lives to not only be a good witness, to be a good example for the Christ, but to be able to talk to people about Jesus, you're going to have to have that kind of life or they're going to, they're going to know. You know, you invite them to church, you know, you need to be careful because they just might come is one of the old sayings. You know, they show up on Sunday night and you're not there. I realize I'm speaking to the creme de la creme, but we need to have the kind of lives that we can be uh, not ashamed to talk to people about the Christ. If you're here this evening, not a New Testament Christian, the plan of salvation is very clear. Hear the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Believe that indeed Jesus is the Christ, John 8, verse 24. Repent of our sins, confessing that indeed Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Be baptized for the mission of our sins, and the Bible tells us that we'll be added to the church. We'll be saved, but don't stop there. Be thou faithful unto death. We can help you at all. We encourage you to come as we together we stand and sing.